Shall we start? Okay, welcome to this uh, session on uh, residential learning and what we think is the future of Open edX. My name is uh, Regis Bimo. I'm the creator, of, uh, the creator of Twitter. I'm the VP of Engineering um, at Edley, and I'm a member of the Open edX Technical Oversight Committee. Um, I'm a software engineer. This is the product track, so I'm <laughs> mostly out of my depth. Luckily, I'm joined by uh, Bilal. Awesome, thank you, Regis. I'm Fakir Bilal, also from Edley. I'm the product director and also product core contributor for OpenEdX. Um, so this is a, a presentation that is um, very close to our heart. Um, I joined Edley very recently, and my job until then was really to make OpenEdX work better. Like, how do we install it? How do you deploy it? And um, Shortly after I joined Edley, I was elected as a TOC member, and my vision shifted from how do we make OpenEdX work better to where do we want to lead OpenEdX. And this is what this presentation um, is about. We're doing this, this, pre this presentation in a context that's, that is a bit difficult. Um, the EdTech sector in general is in a crisis, and the um, MOOCs um, model is suffering uh, even more. It turns out that humans, they, they don't want less interactions with uh, their fellow humans, they want more. And this is, I guess, n the number one lesson that we learned from COVID. And this is really too bad because <laughs> MOOCs are built on the assumption that, hey, we could remove humans from the equation and uh, provide learning uh, all from uh, a screen interface. Turns out that is not true. For those learners that for which the MOOC model work, well, it turns out that these learners are already affluent learners, are learners that have the discipline to learn by themselves, very often learners with uh, already a master's degree. These um, bullet points together means that op the OpenEdX platform does not have a great product market fit. Symptoms of this problem are the fact that um, MOOCs uh, are shrinking in the edX space. Sure, there, there are many learners on Coursera and uh, edX, but the cost of acquisition of every new learner is rising. At two you last year, the cost, the cost of acquisition of a new learner was around $50. This is very high and untenable. I would argue that MOOCs are also a winner-take-all game. Once you have a great um, online course, that is a commodity. And it makes no sense to replicate that course elsewhere in, in, in a different MOOC platforms, platform. So that means that different OpenX platforms are competing with one another instead of leveraging our um, open ecosystem. That, all of that wouldn't be a problem <laughs> if we didn't need to make money. I mean, many open source projects are built around uh, volunteer contributors that, that are not making a, a business out of it. But it turns out that the OpenEdX platform is large and complex and we need um, many contributors to um, make uh, changes to that platform. These contributors in the, in, in the current ecosystem come from um, uh, OpenEdX providers, um, companies that provide services um, built around OpenEdX in some form or another. So if we were just any other company, the solution to that problem would be to pivot. And I, ar I argue, we argue, that this is the case here with OpenEdX. We think that OpenEdX should transition from a single model of open online learning to residential learning. So the, um, the key takeaway from this talk is that we argue that we should be transforming OpenEdX into a viable and appealing open source solution for residential learning. 
And I'm, I'm going to give the, the, the mic to, to Bilal in, uh, in, min in a minute now, and you're going to be making a very strong case for what we should be building and why. During all these explanations, I, I'd, I'd like you to, to remember to think of OpenEdX not as the OpenEdX that we know now, like edX platform and a couple of repositories, a couple of services. Maybe OpenEdX can be something more. Maybe it can be a new product separate from OpenEdX. Maybe it can be something that complements OpenEdX. Maybe it can be an additional layer on top of, on top of OpenEdX and maybe on top of Moodle. All um, the content from these slides come from many conversations that have happened during the conference and way before the conference. Um, there was another talk by Fox Pazienti um, at the beginning of this conference on residential learning. Um, I know that you had many conversations with Jenna and Ed about like, how residen residential learning could have a strong impact on OpenEdX. So this does not <laughs> come out of, of nowhere. <laughs> so uh, that being said, yeah, uh, take it away. Amazing, thank you. So I just want to quickly share what you can expect from today's session. So we want to make a case for everything that uh, we just shared, why we need to make this pivot and have focused on more than one area of online learning. We also want to figure out how to do that. So we're going to propose a framework for figuring out what the gaps are in relation to other platforms. Uh, and we when we say other platforms, we're usually going to mean Instructure, Blackboard, Brightspace by D2L uh, or Moodle. Uh, and we're also going to provide specific areas of focus, both in terms of functionalities uh, and also in terms of business model that can be addressed uh, you know, as part of this new strategy. And the outcome would be to provide a starting point for a strategic roadmap to help us start bridging those gaps. So we are very cognizant that whatever we're going to do is going to involve you know, standing on uh, shoulders of joints. So a lot of success uh, has been accomplished by this community and by you know, the organizations that are involved in this ecosystem. So obviously OpenEdX you know, can be credited for being a pioneer in enabling delivery of massive open online courses. So there are a lot of platforms out there that you know, help you launch a course, but being able to do that in a way that's specifically geared for launching uh, and delivering MOOCs at scale you know, we can safely assume that OpenEdX is one of the pioneers in that. It's being used by prestigious uh, and you know, high, you know, top ranking universities around the world. It's being used for national scale deployments by a number of countries. And it's got a community that's robust, that's supporting different aspects of it from user experience design to user research to marketing. Um, and then, you know, as we saw in the numbers shared by Juan uh, on the first day of the conference, uh, we see new organizations opting for OpenEdX every year. And how can we leverage all the different strengths, both of the community and the platform? So from the platform perspective, you know, having a platform that's highly scalable uh, can support large-scale instances uh, and delivery of MOOCs for tens of millions of users. We also have the open source advantage. Uh, we have a more robust and comprehensive uh, authoring tool in form of the OpenEdX Studio. Our analytics have come a long way in recent uh, years. Uh, and so we can leverage that to make this shift. We're also getting better at interoperability, so the community has been doing a great job of identifying the opportunities there and building those plugins. And a lot of times that, that that's happening for us at Edley is that you know, whenever we're working with our partners and our customers, uh, we're just building those plugins, and our priority is to find a way to do that in a, in a more abstract way so that it could be applicable to other use cases. And then the the global community of OpenEdX that's globally situated, uh, you know, uh, it allows us access to uh, diverse and global institutions around the world. Um, and then again, you know, we have that active community that's helping us build plugins and those resources, and we can you know, potentially come with a vision to help redirect some of that effort to uh, this strategy shift. I'll very quickly talk about the, the use cases involved with this. So the biggest use case for this strategy would be universities and institutions uh, that are currently providing learning in an on-campus setting and providing this software to them for enabling blended learning use cases. So this is probably the biggest ed tech market by segment currently, uh, if not the biggest. Um, and every university is going to need a software for blended learning at some point if they don't already have one. Not every university is going to have MOOCs. 
And so even if we look, our, look at our statistics, you know, maybe there are uh, a couple of thousand universities around the world that are using OpenEdX2 to deliver MOOCs. Uh, there are almost 150,000 plus sites that are uh, you know, used by universities for uh, Moodle and stuff like that. Um, and so that's the challenge we want to solve where building a platform that can enable uh, residential learning and can offer uh, you know, an open source alternative to Canvas uh, and Brightspace. We have some major opportunities here. So the opportunity would be not to just you know, meet the features of these other platforms and you know, leverage the pedagogy first approach of the OpenEdX platform, but also innovate and provide solutions that you know, these other organizations aren't offering or aren't able to offer due to the nature of you know, being proprietary software. The second use case, which was first identified by uh, Jenna from Exim, uh, was about you know, leveraging OpenEdX as an authoring tool. So we have great authoring capabilities. We can create uh, you know, compelling interactive content using it. So there's also a potential use case where you know, if at a university you're using a structure, you can use the authoring capabilities of OpenEdX to you know, just port that content or deliver that to the additional learning that your organization is already using. So that's already happening a lot for OpenEdX as well as other tools because, you know, educators and teachers are using tools like Articulate and Captivate to create content and then just delivering that via the residential learning platform. So now we talk about, like, the main crux of our uh, proposals. What are the main gaps that are help preventing us today from being able to cater to that market? And we've had numerous conversations about this over the years. One of the things that Regis and I wanted to do this year was to uh, propose a framework for evaluating what those gaps are and also determining uh, what the opportunities could be. And hopefully, if we've you know, done an okay job, it should also help us prioritize what to focus on first. So the framework is based on a criteria for evaluating OpenEdX in relation to these other platforms that we were just talking about. And we'll go into uh, the details, so we'll look at them one by one, starting with scalability. So as you all know, OpenEdX is designed for scale. Uh, it supports large-scale MOOC as well as open uh, and online learning initiatives, and it can handle hundreds of thousands of multi, uh, uh, concurrent users. And so that's what it's geared for specifically, but obviously you know, there are a lot of other use cases of OpenEdX as well. For other platforms, it's designed specifically for that smaller and more intimate scale, you know, where the teachers and the students have a much more direct connection. Um, and also, you know, most class sizes are between 20 to 50 people and could even be smaller if it's like, you know, for the graduate context. So we're very good at, you know, at scaling with OpenEdX, but if you want to, you know, scale in the other direction, OpenEdX is harder to use for, that, for those contexts. Uh, and we'll share some specific examples. Right now, I'll just show an example of the sort of things that you could find in other tools that right now you could still manage to do in OpenEdX in certain cases, but you know, it's, it's just going to be maybe a workaround. Um, so for example, uh, here you can see, you know, if I'm using Moodle, I get a granular uh, uh, insight into the academic calendar for different students. I can see what are the activities that they've completed, what their you know, milestones look like. So being able to create my dashboards that allow me to manage my class uh, you know, that's like an area where it's currently really hard to address via the functionality that we already have. Another example would be, you know, just enabling chat or messenger uh, plugin within the application. So that's something, you know, we're working on. We did build that for several of our partners. But being able to connect with students and also being able to link or reference, for example, specific resources and artifacts from within your learning experience, such as, you know, a, a handout or an assessment or your grade and being able to link that in your conversation. It's a feature that's you know, present at pretty much every residential learning platform that we've looked at. And by the right now, if you wanted to do it via OpenEdX, it would obviously have to be an email uh, or through discussion forums. The next criteria is open versus closed. So OpenEdX is on like the open side of the spectrum where the platform is designed to work for the open context. And again, there are a lot of con use cases where it's being used in a closed setting, but the major way that like, the platform is set up, the user experiences, the functionality, uh, the features, they're more catered to that uh, area. Whereas for closed platforms, they're designed specifically for that closed environment where only students that are formally en enrolled at those universities uh, and are taking, you know, uh, and partaking the form formal education at those 
uh, institutions, they're able to access that platform. So that's like a major difference and it manifests in different ways. One example, for example, could be the integration with the student information system that you know, most universities are using and even being able to define you know, things like section, for example, or which you know, area of the university they're going to be in. Um, and even, for example, being able to define the roles of students in a classroom, uh, being able to define who the TAs are, et cetera. The next area is administration and management. So open has done a pretty good job of providing the basic management tools to provide uh, you know, uh, the admins an ability to uh, manage the platform. So there are a number of things that you can do from a technical perspective, from being able to configure the platform to you know, your use case, and there's a lot of versatility, versatility there. But when it comes to these other platforms, you're able to access tools that allow you to manage your platform in context you know, of residential learning. You also get analytics that allow you and support you in that process. And they're integrated with a lot of tools, including, for example, the SIS integration that we talked about. That's a requisite for OpenLX to be able to function um, in this area. And we'll talk about that uh, in, in, in a few minutes. So here's an example of you know, being able to manage the administ administrative side of the platform from an educator's perspective, from the university admin's perspective, uh, being able to define the roles of the students, the instructors, as well as the teacher assistants and all of that stuff, being able to create cases. So they can be academic cases, they can be administrative cases. So for example, if you have a problem with your grade or if you have an administrative problem enrolling in a certain course or you want to drop a course and all of those things, there's this administrative layer that would need to be part of the platform to be able to deliver learning in the residential learning context. The next uh, spectrum is related to teacher's autonomy and it might be one of the more important ones in our opinion. So the idea is that, you know, open edX might be on the side where there's not enough teacher autonomy at an institution level. So you can create courses and you have a lot of control over you know, what that course looks like and what the structure and the content is going to include. Um, and you can deliver that content mostly in an asynchronous and online format. Whereas for other platforms, um, you can manage the content, the courses, the classrooms, the learners, the academic calendar, and you, it's designed to facilitate interaction with students directly. And you know, there are some examples of that. So for example, being able to create competencies and being able to map them, not just for your course, but across the, you know, the, the academic career for the individual students or classes. So for example, if a competency that I'm measuring is you know, certain skills related to algebra, I would be able to see that even beyond, let's say, like the grade the current student is in and just get that information uh, you know, across their uh, you know, like history. Another example would be to be able to create your uh, custom marking schemes and being able to modify that for different projects and being able to even set up uh, macros for yourself. So there's a lot of capabilities in these other platforms that are designed specifically for the digital use case. That's an area where we are able to do that to a certain extent through OpenEdX, but there are you know, certain limitations and for a lot of things you kind of have to use workarounds or just do some custom development to enable that. Yet another factor is versatility versus specificity. It also happens to be another thing that we've talked about a lot. Uh, so, you know, OpenEdX, like the amazing thing about OpenEdX is that it could be a starting point to any number of, uh, you know, use cases for learning. So, at, at least we can, you know, test that firsthand. So we have uh, OpenEdX being, you know, used to power learning for K-12. Uh, for partner learning at enterprises, uh, we're even using uh, OpenEdX to, you know, uh, provide training to Air Force pilots on how to use supercomputers. So the variety in the use cases, uh, you know, is, is, is very diverse, and that's an amazing thing. But for example, you know, if you want to be really good at solving a problem, and it's a problem that a lot of people have, a generic platform might not be the best solution for that. So the other platforms that we've talked about, you know, they're specifically designed for the use case of residential learning. Uh, and all the features and the, like the way interaction design is set up for these platforms, how the assessment model works, they're all set up to uh, provide support uh, for synchronous and blended learning, which could be happening in form of blended learning, or it could be hybrid learning that a lot of institutions have. So an example would be to just look at the dashboards for some of these tools. So for example, if we look at Instructure's dashboard, you can see all the 
course that you're currently enrolled in, what their status is, you can access your academic calendar, you can access your grade book, uh, you can see all of your pending assignments and tasks. You can also access your group calendars that you have with other students or, in, or with your teachers. And those are sort of things where you can see right away just like how these platforms are oriented to that specific problem, uh, where you know, it just makes them more specialized. And for Open edX to be able to address that, and if our starting point is a platform that's you know, pretty generic, uh, it's, you know, could look like, like a daunting process to, you know, start addressing some of these gaps if we decide to address, you know, this new market uh, of users. We're able to do badges and badging and credentialing within Open edX, you know, using third-party tools. There are a lot of cases where that's been, like, custom-built for different platforms, but being able to do that, especially for K-12 context, using that to, you know, uh, evaluate discussions and the quality of interactions that the students are having, being able to automate that. Uh, you get a lot more control with these other tools, um, and that's another uh, area where you know, educators want to be able to use features like this if they want to do that using Open edX. It's going to be a little bit harder um, compared to these other platforms. Another basic example would be you know, just enabling roll calls. So in an on-campus setting, if you're using a software for blended learning, you need to be able to take a roll call and it could look like a deceptively simple capability, you know, just like seeing who's present and absent. But as you look into this a little bit further, you know, it, it requires like a, a bunch of functionality and interaction design support to enable that effectively in a classroom setting. And then we've got integration and interoperability. So that's another major area uh, where we can see that there's a gap between Open edX and the other platforms. So on one side, we have Open edX where we, of course, have API support for third-party integrations. We can in in integrate with a number of tools and services, and you, know, you can adapt it to different use cases. But with some of these other platforms, or most of them that we've looked at, um, everything that you need to install this, uh, it's all the software with, within the context of your university or your institution, it's pretty much there. So Right on the shelf, for example, you can integrate with uh, student information systems, um, and they have extensive support as far as that is concerned. So I'm, I'm sure most people know what SIS are, but you know, a student information system is where you know, all of the, uh, the student information is being tracked. That's how industry is used to uh, manage uh, different aspects of you know, enrolling students, onboarding students, managing their fees, uh, managing their resources, and all those things. So you know, it's basically the uh, enterprise resource planning tool for the uh, on-campus use case. So these are some of the main platforms and, uh, that you know, provide an SIS solution. And Canvas just provides those integrations right out of the box. So that process is much more seamless. And that would be a critical functionality that OpenEdX would need to have, either through you know, plugins or integrations to be able to support uh, SIS integrations uh, and being able to create uh, SIS imports so that they can use those existing systems at, those, at the universities. Another example would be, for example, integrating with communication tools. So a lot of universities um, you know, use uh, workplace apps like Microsoft uh, Office 365 or Google or apps, and being able to do that seamlessly and have that integration be uh, you know, like working with the, the LMS, that's a critical feature. So you'll have an academic calendar uh, that needs to be able to sync. Uh, you will have milestones you'll have communication that's happening both on the LMS as well as these tools that needs to be integrated. And so that's another, um, we can call it a requisite for Open edX to be able to function in this space. And it's also easier to manage plugins and X blocks, like we would call them for Open edX, in the context of uh, some of the other tools. So for example, this is what that experience looks like for Moodle, where you can just select uh, you know, a plugin from the directory, or you can upload the file, and the process is, involves a fewer steps, you know, compared to Open edX. So throughout this framework, you know, we saw a criteria where, you know, we had Open edX on one side and these other tools on the other side, and then there's a gap, and now we're going to talk about you know, the fun part where what could be some ways to start addressing that gap. I want to start talking about what's already been accomplished or in works currently within the community or at different organizations that we were talking to uh, as we were preparing this presentation. So there's a lot of work that's already happening to help bridge that gap, in, in, in a lot of cases specifically for the res residential use case. 
but you know, also for other use cases as well. So for example, uh, you know, there's work being done for credentials, uh, as far as the teacher autonomy is concerned, being able to create uh, children courses, uh, to improve the specificity of the platform, being able to have graded discussions, and all of those things are examples of things that are where the work is happening to help bridge that gap for Open edX. And one thing that we've done is we've mapped all those features across these uh, different criteria that we talked about. Another thing to consider, and this might be like the most critical perspective, is that of a university administrator or the procurement department that needs to make that decision about you know, using Open edX for this use case. In most cases, they probably already have a software they're using, for example, Moodle or Instructure. And so what are the things that they would be considering? So as you might imagine, there's a lot of research that's been done in this area and figuring out what their top priorities are, how important all those things are to them. And so there are a lot of researches that you can find about what are the main considerations um, would be. And so we've ranked them um, in, in order. So like the most important thing that they would be looking for is does, for example, if they're considering open edX, is does it have all these essential features and functionalities that we would, you know, we know we would need them? The next one is user experience and ease of use. So they want to be able to use the software, not just them, but also the educators, the teachers, the students. The integration and compatibility, does it, you know, work well with the systems that the university is already using? Security and compliance is another ma major factor. And then the cost vendor evaluation and the implementation model, how, it's, uh, how is it going to look like for them? Does it work with the IT system and the procurement processes in place at those institutions? So this is a list of all of the features and functionality. I'm not going to call it an exhaustive list, but it's you know like a complete-ish list of things that the platforms we've talked about have in terms of things that users are currently using for the residential use case that we currently don't have in OpenEdX. And some we do, but they're not in, at a level uh, where we could easily adapt them for, for the use case. So we've divided them by the admin role, the educator, uh, and the student. And a lot of these things are going to have you know, an overlap across all three users. So for example, if you have an academic calendar, the educator will need to have access to it, and they'll have their own interface for that. The student will have their own interface, um, and then the uh, admin will be configuring that. So for a lot of these features, they're going to have um, you know, multiple um, interfaces for, for different types of users. And next, I'll invite uh, Regis to like, share more specifics about how we go about bridging that gap and building that strategic roadmap that we were talking about. Thank you. Yeah, so how do we get there? Um, if there's one thing that we really don't want is to is to uh, is for this talk to be only aspirational um we'd like to have some very concrete steps on how to get there um and so i want to leave some time for discussion but uh, i'd like to highlight some very concrete steps that uh, we should be taking as a community uh, all the um the right components are already in place in the um in the ecosystem to build the features that you've outlined to um, to improve the platform and to uh, market it to uh, to a new audience, um, I think that what is missing is really this uh, willingness to go in in this uh, direction. We have the the working groups that are really efficient at at communicating. We have this um, new Axim overlord, which I think is much better than the previous one. Um, so how, if, uh, in practice, do we put this in motion? And sure, we could be waiting for OpenEdX to have a slimmer core, to have more extension points. And all the people that I know in the community are doing the right things for that. It's still pretty big cargo to turn around and I don't think that um, we have the time to wait for OpenEdX to have a slim core to um, start implementing all these things that uh, Bilal has described and even if we do even if we eventually get to a very slim core that we can start extending 
how do we foster the environment, like um, this ecosystem of contributors that will build these uh, innovations? So un unless, well, uh, there's a risk that you might have the, mi the, the wrong impression. We are not trying to say that we should be building a new LMS, that we should be rewriting OpenEdX in a different programming language, um, that we should all jump ship and go to Moodle. That this is not the case. We have an LMS. We know that building an LMS is, is difficult. <laughs> if, if anything, we know that by now. Uh, so let's keep that. Let's leverage that. What should we be doing? Like, if we were just any other company, we should innovate. And how do we innovate? There's um, a very a precise um, uh, handbook for that. The way to do that is to create a minimal viable product. It takes little energy, little funding, though still a little. <laughs> we build a thing, check product market fit, iterate, improve, and then either it works, and then we keep improving it, or we abandon it. And by the way, this is what happened with uh, Tudor. It, it, it only uh, took me like a couple of weeks to have a very good proof of concept of Tudor working. And then I knew that I had something on my hand that was really valuable. Then it was a lot of churn <laughs> after that. Um, same with Cairn. But then I built a, a couple other plugins that no one <laughs> ever used and um, th that followed the same, the same loop. And we argue that we should be doing the same thing here in this ecosystem. And it uh, uh, turns out that we are in luck because um, um, we have the 500 pound gorilla uh, in the room, and that is, uh, that is Axum. Can you go to the next slide? So we are arguing for a Marshall Plan for open source innovation in the OpenEdX ecosystem. Mm. Very concretely, Axum should put together requests for proposals for open source innovations in the ed tech sector. And these proposals should not have big funding. Te we propose 10 to 50K, such that um, many different companies ca can submit, including the smaller providers, which are suffering the most uh, right now, but also newcomers to the, to, to the community. Um, and then the end result of these requests for proposals must adhere to the OpenEx DNA, which is to be open source, reusable, um, translatable, documented, um, and in a nutshell, I think uh, that Axum should become the um, basically a, um, a VC for seed funding of um, innovation startups in the OpenEx ecosystem, and we have that luxury. It is possible. So um, with that in mind, so in, in a second, we'll <laughs> um, open the floor for questions. Um, this is a plan that we're pushing for. Um, we hope you agree. Uh, according to the many conversations we had during the conference, we think you do. Um, but yeah, we're very much open for um, uh, questions and uh, conversations. So the, the question is, would we be taking out uh, Canvas uh, and Moodle if we uh, um, had feature parity? Uh, yeah, probably not, I would say. Um, so for example, even right now, there are open source alternatives to Canvas and Blackboard. So for example, Moodle or Sakai, those are examples of platforms that are open source, that have communities around them, and are being used by uh, tens of thousands of universities. There's still a lot of value in having a software where you get the enterprise support, uh, help you meet compliance requirements and all those things. A lot of institutions don't want a self-host adoption. They want to be able to just outsource that part of the software completely. And so there's that area where a lot of institutions will still probably opt to you know, use those proprietary platforms. 
but we're assuming, and based on the data that we've seen, that there's also a huge market for organizations that do want to either self-host on their premises or have more control over their platform and their data. And so that's the market we're looking to tap, which uh, we feel could be a substantial fraction of like this overall segment. We, 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 we don't want to reach, well, uh, we're not arguing that, to, that we should be reaching for feature parity. Uh, the Moodle and Canvas are showing us what works. We need to invent what is going to work next. Yeah, and so one of the things that you said about the goal was that we want it to be a viable alternative to these other tools, but we also want it to be an appealing alternative. So there needs to be some innovation to kind of, you know, one-up them in some area where we can. And there are a lot of, in, um, you know, intrinsic strengths of OpenEdX that could be leveraged for that. Thank you, Regis, and appreciate the inspiring presentation. And um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Stephanie with Axum, and so I appreciate the invitation to have a dialogue about this. Um, and certainly our team, meaning the full team of the open community, is really important to, um, to the direction. A couple comments. One is um, I really appreciate your focus on residential and campus as a way to frame the problem and starting to think about what does more human connection mean? And I would suggest to go even deeper, like double or triple click on that, because um, it's not really just on campus. I think there is evidence that hybrid blended learning leads to not just better access, but better persistence, better completion, and maybe even better prospects for economic mobility for students. And so I suggest we really, I mean, Axum's name is access and impact. We need to lean in harder on the impact and say what problem are we solving for whom and how are we really thinking about the future that we're defining. And so it might start with residential and campus, but the fact is that there's some balance between what people are going to do online synchronously, asynchronously, where you have internet access where you don't, where you have mobile, you don't. And so really understanding what problem you're solving and then start taking the numbers and putting it against that. So Professor Jansen this morning spoke about his completion rates. Does anyone remember what his completion rates are here in, Cape, in, uh, in South Africa? 23%, 23%. What do you think it is in the US for broad access institutions? Actually, I bet you Elizabeth knows. Oh, I thought you would know. So, um, because ASU does a good job of doing better than the average. So, if you, uh, it's less than 50%. If you're low income, first gen, a person of color, some otherwise marginalized background, underserved background, it's more like 23%. And those numbers hold up around the world. They hold up in the Philippines, they hold up in a lot of places. So, there is the opportunity to fill that gap. Why are not more students completing? We're putting our exciting numbers up. We should put not only how many people do we have enrolled, but how many people are completing and why. And let's use the data to figure out what, what works, what doesn't work, and whether or not they have, you know, it leads to better livelihoods. So, so that's my first thing. Let's get more precise on the problem and then how to use data to then figure out what impact looks like. I think that is the edge of the competitive advantage. And so then we're out of feature function comparisons and saying what problem are we solving and how can we do better because we're an open source community. So I think that's sort of the first sort of challenge and opportunity. I think the second one is what you said too about how do we tap the community. I mean, I'm just so inspired by how many people really care deeply about providing um, a better education globally. I mean, it's an aspiring ideal and vision and edX only got us so far because it was people who already had degrees and who, you know, who, um, and most of, most of us who did take courses and didn't have degrees, we didn't finish either, by the way. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's, it's hard to do when you have other things going on. So how do we tap the community with all of the um, commitment to actually sign up for those plugins to SISs, because that's going to have to happen. Well, how does it coexist with Canvas? People aren't going to jettison Canvas because it's hard to take an installed product. And so how do we mobilize the community to do more of that? Because it takes more than you know, our small and mighty team. And it should, because that's how we're going to actually proliferate more broadly. So those are a couple things that I think we can go deeper on. And then how do we third spur innovation? I mean, I, I love that. We need to be on the 
cutting edge, bleeding edge, somewhere there, because that's actually going to um, take us further, especially where technology can help make things more effective. Like I was just in the IBM SkillsNet presentation. I mean, how do you use AI to do more with less? And I think that idea of ingenuity to do more with less it will help us reach more learners. So those are a few thoughts or comments. And um, you know, I think all of us together, the 800 pound gorilla is not just Axum. And what we hope to do is catalyze a community that really drives, um, drives impact. And happy to take any thoughts or questions. <laughs> th th thank you so much for that. Yeah, uh, if anything, I would like to also improve the uh, human to human uh, interactions. If, if only that, then it could be a success. And I agree that we have all the right puzzle pieces in place. We just need to glue them together. Yeah. Okay. Um, thanks for putting this together. I appreciate sort of the fact that you ended with a proposal that was specific. Um, I do imagine that we will need to think about ways to, yes, surface things like RFP processes and other things. I suspect there's enough topics that we need to cover that even with the modest budget, that probably won't scale. So we will need to think as a community about other ways to crowdsource funding, group projects together, get people interested. Things we've talked about for a long time, but are in practice very difficult to achieve. Um, so the interesting thing I think is that like, you called out earlier that there was sort of, has been a shift in sort of like the central overlord ownership of the platform and it is much better now. And, all, and I agree with that. The interesting thing about this though, with like the RFP processes, there is also a question about like, how do we decide what things become RFP investment areas and what are those themes? Whether it's, you know, let's double, triple down on residential or it's other things, like that is an open question. But um, I do think we need something here because a chronic problem is that in the flexibility and configuration that we highlight as a strength of the platform means, I don't know, we've got seven video X blocks. We've probably got five different discovery services. We've got, you know, so some of that is necessary in order to explore the space, but there comes a point where we should have mechanisms to come together in a more central way for the community. And I don't feel like that's happening often enough. So that's the, what I wanted to share based on this, but I, I would be excited to find ways for us to sort of collaborate more obviously and more frequently. Just a quick remark I have about that is that we have a product review process now, and maybe the next iteration of that process could be to help us figure out what opportunities are ripe for the RFP process, for example. Hey, so, uh, well, first of all, I, I would much rather think of ourselves as stewards at Axum rather than overlords. Uh, but in any case, um, with this, you know, you said that you don't want to create a new LMS. Totally support that. Uh, and you also showed a UX experience that is vastly different for like optimized for the particular use case of residential. So I'm curious like what you, how you see us kind of straddling the line in terms of, you know, whether there are different flavors that are enabled, whether this is like, you know, whether we have one unified interface that manages to stretch both ways, like what, what sort of are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so one of the things that uh, I remember Jenna presented at the 2022 conference about the product manifesto, and one of the things there was to have like that simplified and streamlined core, and then have these different flavors that are catered towards specific markets. So for example, even if you look at Moodle, um, it's an open source platform designed specifically for on-campus and K-12 context, for example, and now it's extended to other use cases as well. So for example, you could look at something like Totara, which is also based on Moodle, but designed specifically for the LXP use case and for corporate learning. So maybe that's the way to go. But do you see those living, say, on the same instance? Like, like say, I have an institution and some of I'm doing some stuff on campus, I'm doing some stuff in Moodle. Like, does that live in the same instance or would we talking about like, in, like each instance is optimized for a particular um, mode of operation? There's no one size fits all uh, answer. Um, I, I'm definitely not a product person, so I wouldn't be in a very good position to answer that. But I feel like many of the features that were described there would benefit from running outside of edX platform. I mean, outside of open edX as we know it today, and maybe connect to open edX um, optionally, like, like, like separately. Maybe they would share the same theme, uh, but people who 
run, I don't know, uh, a roll call uh, piece of software, don't really have to know that it's connected to, to OpenEdX. Um, and it's, it, it's really, um, yeah, this is what I, what I was alluding to when I was saying, okay, maybe we can build stuff inside OpenEdX, maybe we can build stuff next to OpenEdX, maybe we can build stuff completely separate of OpenEdX, maybe on top. Um, and this is why we need um, calls for proposals. Um, there will be many more great ideas coming up from the community, especially if there's funding behind it, than I could give you right now uh, standing on my feet here. So. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. Another David. Um, so I'd like to focus in on the last ma statement where you say we need Axum to be the Y combinator of open source ed tech. As someone who's recently gone from venture capital backed startups to positive impact ventures, um, I think the one thing about Y combinator is it relies on this sort of thesis of the, of the unicorn. We want the massive exit, what happens? And now when we move over, we need to think about a new toolbox. Um, and that toolbox here probably looks something like um, impact bonds, where institutional and government investors can say, when you get that right, then this amount is there. And then Axum is the enabling um, entrepreneurial investor for that impact bond to say, well, we'll start with that amount. Then when that happens, these people wanted to see that happen, but they're not willing to invest at risk. But once it happens, so impact bonds, other techniques for supporting the success of these initiatives because otherwise you know we do risk a bit of what we've seen what I've seen in other communities the sort of spray and pray and then it doesn't happen and everyone loses faith and we get stuck so how do we look at the actual I, I love that you I didn't know until now it was access and impact you know we look at what those impact points are and how we put that behind everything that's what fascinates me and I'd love to see how that stitches into the conversation around creating the RFP with its success criteria that says, it's not just that we made the software work, but that we made it move the needles and that we actually got to see it making a positive impact. I think that's the thing for me that makes these change. So that's, that was my contribution and I don't know if there is thinking in that space or if we need to start moving that way, so. Yeah, that's a great point. Uh, I think having a holistic approach towards the roadmap that just doesn't cover the product, but it's also targeting impact outcomes. Um, I think being able to build that holistic roadmap and the framework to support that would be uh, a good starting point. Be to help. The, maybe the Y Combinator um, comparison was not fully adequate. I, th I think we have a truly unique situation on our hands where we have a foundation that has a lot of money to do good. <laughs> And um, so it, it, does, it doesn't need a unicorn. I mean, a unicorn would, would be nice, <laughs> but um, yeah, we, we need to invent uh, a new model here. Well, yeah, just to echo everybody else, thanks for this awesome presentation. I think the parity analysis and the rubric is also really helpful to help us start to think about the framework for this. How are we going to approach this? Um, this this is admittedly more of a this U.S. focused um, statement, but I went to a conference last year called Educause, which is one of the biggest education technology, con actually the biggest education technology conference here in the States. It's pretty U.S. focused, um, but it's, it's like thousands and thousands of people. The exhibit hall is is massive. Um, and I was, I, was, I was prepared for this, but I wasn't quite prepared for the extent of it, of how entrenched Canvas is in the higher ed space um, to the point where it's, it's like a monopoly <laughs> in a lot of ways at this point, at least in the States. This may not be true globally. Um, but I was, I was um, surprised by this to a certain degree, not surprised to another degree. They have a massive sales and marketing arm. They've got customer support that is available 24-7. Um, and I think you're right, Blah, like we'll probably never be able to totally replace that, and we pro that's probably not the right goal for us. Um, I know early on we, we did, had a couple of conversations in the temporary campus working group that we had around, like, what is our strategy in this space? Is it simply parity? Is it to leapfrog? Um, and I would just, I would encourage you to, to kind of bring that conversation back into the space as well. Parity is going to be important to a certain degree just to enable, to, to compete like at all <laughs> in the space. We're going to have to like have the right, the right sets of features that are going to enable um, just basic um, 
accomplishment of the things that need to be done. But I don't like we're not gonna we're not gonna win, right? It's not it's this is not like a competitive space where we're likely to ever take over the Canvas offerings, right? And I don't think that we should personally. Um, so I guess the, the bigger question is how do we leapfrog in this space? And it, instead of thinking about like not just thinking about parity, but how do we leverage our strengths as a platform and occupy parts of this this market where Canvas is never going to go because they're too, you know, if we're we're a big Titanic ship, they are 12 Titanic ships, right? Like it's they're they're never going to innovate and create. And so, how can we look at um, you know meeting parity, yes, but also leapfrogging beyond that, um, just as a kind of a frame of reference for thinking about like the value proposition of of this product. Yeah, absolutely. And I think I was building on that as well, that infographic that you made as well about, you know, parity and then leapfrogging into something that's more innovative. And we tried to cover that in our goal as well, where it's going to be viable, where it's, you know, going to meet all those points of parities. But it's also going to build on disparities where, you know, we build uh, innovative solutions and leverage the pedagogy first approach of the platform to kind of you know, just stand out as well and not become part of a crowded market. I would also encourage, you know, everyone here to like check out, for example, how companies like Instructure, you know, have a sales strategy against open source solutions like Moodle, for example. So it's fun to read the kind of things that they would say and, you know, basically the ideas. You would, must be dumb to go for an open source alternative to what we're offering because, you know, you don't want to host it, you don't want to care about all these things, just leave it to us. And obviously we disagree and so, Oh, that's right here. It's very effective, though. I mean, in speaking with administrators at this conference, like they're 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 very gun shy and very um, frightened, actually, of open source. Like they they're you know, they're they're trying to reach uh, things in a streamlined and effective way from their perspective, and that to them is more important than the. They may agree with the ethos of open source, but like in reality and in practice, they're very gun shy about it. So. Yeah. Uh, I saw yeah Peter. Um, I just want to mention the, uh, the history of things that have been worked on already and make sure that you're taking those into consideration. Um, uh, MIT is an institution that uh, chose Canvas uh, during the pandemic and we have uh, already done integrations with Canvas, they're not great, but they're uh, the, the minimal of what we needed to do to uh, maintain uh, open ed X as an option for the faculty who wanted to continue using it. Um, Harvard invested in some features too. I don't know if they still use them. Um, and a lot of these things didn't fit uh, into open ed X in a clear way at the time. So they're kind of, uh, those features that we don't talk about um, and uh, they you know coming from campuses that have already invested in canvas it seems like an opportunity to think about how to uh, work in an environment um, that has canvas uh, and another thing to think about too the just the way MIT is uh, edX wasn't innovative enough and flexible enough so new things were created um, but those had to work with edX as well. So they're um, thinking about how those um, interaction points and integration points is still very important. Um, and I'm speaking from the, the ones that I know well, but there are other institutions who did uh, very ad hoc blended environments with uh, edX. I think um, uh, University of British Columbia comes to mind, I think was one of them. Um, and uh, trying to surface those experiences, I think, would be instructive. Yeah, I think that's very helpful context. So a lot of teams, like, you know, uh, at Edley work with teams at MIT. So we have a lot of familiarity with MIT Residential and other platforms like that that are being used in that residential learning context. We're also aware of other universities. For example, the University of Queensland also has, like, a hodgepodge yeah. of, like, Blackboard and, uh, and, and, and OpenEdX. Um, and, and so that's something we've looked at as well in, in terms of, you know, uh, what we're proposing as a strategy. So yeah, that's a super helpful context that you just raised. Thank you. Um, as you know, we have been driving a one-year project to try to add some uh, on-campus features. Uh, moving a university that already has a, an on-campus uh, system is very difficult. First, you have to offer the same things that the teachers are used to, to use because 
even with the change of version of an LMS, you're going to have a lot of people in the university telling you that this is worse, this is worse, because they are used to the other thing. So you need a very, very uh, big improvement in anything to move it. Or the institution uh, feels that they are paying too much, or they are in Blackboard or whatever, and they, they are willing to change because it's outdated. But competing against Canvas or Moodle that is uh, at the moment uh, I think that it should be something incremental. For example, in Hermann's University, they are having Moodle and OpenEdX for the new innovative things. But for this to work and go again uh, and go more, you need to add the same capabilities, the file management, the task management, the, uh, everything that every teacher is used to, to do. And the other thing is that integrating an LMS with your student information system is expensive and it's gonna and you're gonna need it and what you have said that having out of the box integration I don't feel about that is is the right thing because every university has a different student management system what we need is strong APIs a student API a course API that are e easy to use so if someone wants to move they're gonna spend money but not so much money but try, trying to cover all the different student information systems my university has own information system his university has a consortium of universities in Spain made, a, and they are using 20 different universities. Probably MIT is using another one, and Columbia is very difficult. You need to give a very good mechanism with APIs, because everything that you have said, in most universities, no one uh, creates a course or changes a student in the, in the LMS. You have it in your student management system that is not only student, because you need to take into account the teacher load and the number of groups, and, and things change every day. In my university, every day at night, they move students, they create courses, they create groups they, uh, with a connection between the student information system that is the place that manages this and the, the LMS. So you need to do this very streamlined with, with APIs so if someone is willing to change. And uh, that was only uh, what I wanted to say to, to put it a little bit in context of, of what we have been looking at, at least from the uh, universities in Europe point of view. I don't know if in, in the States it's different. So thank you. Yeah, those are some really good points. And I think uh, both of us probably agree with you 100%. So the proposal wouldn't be to just like build everything that needs to be built, but would be to identify the opportunities that allow us to plant that weed that can then grow and allow us to get that foot in the door with these universities. And the use case that we can imagine is, is there something that universities are going to start doing where they can you know, potentially consider using open edX for the potential learning use case? And it could be one course, it could be one program, uh, and they're able to scale that. I think that we, we, we still have an advantage, at least from my point of view, is that the learning ex experience, I don't know, I don't know Brightcoff, for example, but I've used Canvas, I've used Moodle, uh, we, we have Sakai, and the learning experience, the organization for the student, for me, our, uh, the open edX is better. The way you have the content and the way, so this is still an advantage, they are trying to as we are trying to copy them, they are trying to, to copy it. And uh, at this point, for example, there are some universities that are adding it for, mm, uh, let's say, innovative uh, ways of doing things uh, or this type of thing. So perhaps uh, thinking about an approach which everything is very easy to install. So if someone wants to, to use it and start using it for small things, could be an approach. Yeah, absolutely. And about your second point, um, yeah, I think we agree with, uh, there as well where we're not saying, and I don't think we suggested that we should build all those integrations. The idea was that we're just documenting the, the disparity right now between what we have and what these big players currently have. And so that we know that that's the, something that they will support out of the box. And the proposal wouldn't be to just start doing that. It would be, to, for example, just start by supporting SIS imports. If you can do that, we address a part of that gap and then just start building on that. The community, I think, like they've done already, have like built integrations and plugins that allow us to kind of work with those SIS systems and so just kind of evolving that effort into focusing more on the, uh, this like new strategy. So that probably would be our proposal instead of like, you know, going through that list and saying how can we start building those integrations.